Welcome to the Exposing Jezebel's Influence webinar with Dr. James W. Gall, the president of God Encounters Ministries. Today, you're going to learn how you can recognize and live free from Jezebel's influence. <laughs> Raise your hand if that sounds good. Through the power and authority of Jesus Christ. Well, my name is Jeffrey Thompson, and I've been serving alongside of James Gall as part of the God Encounters Ministries team for over 14 years. And recently, I've also joined the team with Empower 2000. And my wife and I, Brooke, have six beautiful children. And my passion is to equip people to grow in the fire of God and walk in the fullness of all God has for them. Well, before I continue further, I want to thank each of you that are watching live or seeing the replay for choosing to invest your time and your energy to be part of this session today with Dr. Gall. Well, today, like all days, the Lord is releasing the sights and sounds of heaven. So be ready to receive everything he has for you. We believe that today your life is going to change forever. And that's a good thing. Holy Spirit is expanding each of our minds and spirits to new dimensions, and they will never retract their original size or shape. Well, for those of you that may not be familiar with James Gall, I want to introduce him briefly to you. He's the founder of God Encounters Ministries, a speaker all over the globe, and one who resources the body of Christ. James is the author of more than 40 books with numerous study guides and classes. I encourage you to visit uh, the God Encounters Ministries website at GodEncounters.com where you can be resourced through James's blog, classes, free media, and online store. And if you don't already know, we believe that God Encounters are for everyone, and that includes you. So we just pray that today God will encounter you like he never has before or that you never have experienced him in that way before. So we just are looking forward to this session, exposing Jezebel's influence. So James, welcome to today's broadcast. Hey, thank you, uh, Jeffrey. And, and so uh, those of you who are seeing the PowerPoint there, uh, that is my family, my immediate family of 16. So that's my four grown adult kids, their spouses, and so far, seven grandchildren. I have to do this, the gal to the far right with a baby on her hip. That's my oldest daughter, Grace Ann, and tomorrow is her 32nd birthday. So I know you're not watching, Grace Ann, but happy birthday, Grace Ann. <laughs> okay, so are we ready to start, Jeffrey? Absolutely. Okay, so let me pray, and we will begin on exposing Jezebel's influence. And this is going to be full of insight, biblical grounding, and some practical applications. So Father, thank you for such a time as this that we get to learn from the Word of God. Holy Spirit, illuminate cast the spirit of revelation upon the written word and those who have studied this subject for years let new insight come and those who are new let there be like opening up an entire new chapter of life for them and so we thank you for such a time as this in Jesus name all right, so let's go to uh, exposing Jezebel's influence. And uh, I typically, if you're new, uh, I have a, a theme verse that I do. And today for this session, the theme verse comes from Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. But I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. She teaches and she leads my bond servants astray so that they commit act 
of immorality and they eat sacred things uh, and they act immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, give a little background, which, of course, I'm going to be doing a lot of here in a moment. But you see, this is New Testament teaching. This is Jesus to John the Beloved on the Isle of Patmos, and then he is bringing forth this revelation to the seven churches of Asia Minor. It is believed that perhaps this is historical, that these lessons are for every one of those churches, here at Thyatira, but they also could be representing, could be, different periods of time in church age, the church age, as well as that church, those seven churches at that period of time. But it is true in the historical setting for that church, and these weaknesses and strengths are being pointed out. But these truths are also relevant for us today. They are relevant in the second apostolic age. They are relevant in the end times, in the last days. Let's do the scripture together one more time. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself, that's really important, it doesn't say that someone else was acknowledging her authority, she drops her own name. She's claiming it herself. She calls herself a prophetess. Problem is, a lot of people come in alignment with that false teaching. Who calls herself a prophetess? That says a lot. That is already meaning that there's not submission to authority. It's already saying that this personage, this spirit, is full of um, uh, ego and uh, self uh uh, promotion, self-promotion, because she calls herself a prophetess. Now, then it tells part of the fruit that happens and what she tries to do. It says she leads even the bond servants. So this is a word of warning to us as well today, because even the elect can become deceived. Hmm. And now it shows some of the ultimate fruit not the beginning fruit, the ultimate fruit of the Jezebel influence, saying that they will commit acts of immorality and they move from pure and undefiled religion and worshiping Jesus, and they move back over into plurality of gods and idolatry. Okay, so that's saying a lot. And it's a warning. Okay, let's now go from this opening scripture to our notes, to the background historically on Queen Jezebel and her tactics. And I'm gonna, we're going to do a lot of scriptures together this session and the session that will follow in two weeks on the Ahab problem and the Jehu solution. So, but before we dive into these scriptures, I gotta tell you something. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That is my goal today, to give you undiluted truth, and that truth will break strongholds, and those who know the truth and in bring the truth into their heart, into their lives, and don't resist the truth, but love the truth, they'll know the truth, and they'll be set free. Okay, background on Queen Jezebel and her tactics. A look at 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 31. It came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of Sidonians, and went to serve Baal 
and worshiped him. That there, the reference, it doesn't use the name, but it talks about marriage. So who's the husband? The husband is Ahab. Ahab married her contrary to God's command. And he thus opened a door through the wrong marriage as she was married to Baal worship and into multiple gods of sacrifice of idolatry. Ahab brings his lineage, but he becomes one in flesh, thus one in spirit that you join yourself to. Ahab married her contrary to God's command. And he opened then a door to his life and his entire lineage to religious idolatry of Baal worship, which included acts of child sacrifice. This is really important. Do you know that that continues today? And do you understand that? We, in looking at these lessons today, we could be uncovering some of the demonic tactics that are behind child sacrifice today. File that away. Ahab married her, her contrary to God's command. He opened the door to the religious idolatry of Baal worship, which included acts of child sacrifice licentiousness that would be in the book of galatians a party spirit doing what's right in your own eyes if it feels good do it acts of child sacrifice licentiousness including both heterosexual and homosexual fertility rights there's the beginning problem was a marriage outside of the covenant of God. And when that was done, it became a marriage of the religious demonic spirits, and they get joined together. Second, let's look at 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 4. For when Jezebel then destroyed, look what Jezebel did historically. For when Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in caves and provided them with bread and water. A very simple point here is that in the very origin, Jezebel hated God's word and killed off, attempted to kill off the true prophets of God that would be ambassadors or megaphones, or bring forth God's word. So it, it, she hated God's word, and she also hated the messengers who would bring God's word. Pause. Obadiah, a little story. A little early for a story, I know. But many years ago, around 17 or so, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, Obadiah, read Obadiah. And I go, yeah, the guy, the minor prophet, the guy with the little book. And the Holy Spirit goes, no, read Obadiah. And he go, yeah, the guy with the little book. And the Holy Spirit persisted. And he said to me a third time, no, read Obadiah, 1 Kings 18. Now, I went to the Lord and I said, what do you mean, Obadiah in 1 Kings 18? I've taught first 18, first Kings 18 around the world for years. There's no Obadiah in first Kings 18. Well, guess who was right and who was wrong? The Holy Spirit knows the word of God. So I reread first Kings 18 and I found a little man named Obadiah. And the Holy Spirit asked me a question. He said, what did Obadiah do when Jezebel was ruling. I go, Obadiah gathered the prophets and Obadiah hid the prophets in caves. And he spoke to me about my friend Lou Engle 
with a type of an Elijah anointing, and he said, what do you think Obadiah and those prophets were doing in the caves when, oh, when Elijah was confronting in the public the prophets of Baal? I reread it, and it doesn't say that you get an idea that they were hidden in the caves to do intercession because there's always people in the front room and people in the back room. I call these cave dwellers. I want to encourage some of you right now. Your behind the scenes work can be just as important as the front person who has the big platform. I've often, often been a cave dweller. There it is. And I've been an Obadiah that has gathered then, see, prophets together to take up intercessory assignments, and we need that in these days. Okay, so Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord. Obadiah took a hundred prophets, hid them in caves of fifty, and he provided for them. Jezebel hated God's word and killed off the true prophets of God. Next, a look at 1 Kings 18, verse 19. He said, what sin have I committed that you are giving your servant into the hand of Ahab to put me to death. Jezebel was a very prominent supporter even of religious works. Jezebel partners with religious activity to give a smokescreen of a false appearance of good. Did you hear that? Jezebel tries to operate within a religious system. He said, what sin have I committed that you're going to give your servant into the hand of Ahab to put me to death? Jezebel was very prominent, supporter of religious works, as she even fed the false prophets and was, she was their support system. Guys, people, this is already loaded with lots of understanding. You know, a lot of people go off. They start pure and they go off. Out of sometimes need, out of this, out of pressure, out of this, out of that. And Jezebel is a false religious system. And it, when prophets in particular don't receive the honor, that they're supposed to, which is comes the word salarium, which deals with finances. And when you don't give finances and honor, and then the prophets are put in a weak place, you know, sometimes they move into manipulation. And they mm, only, okay, let's move on. I hope you get some of where I was just hinting at. Jezebel was a very prominent supporter of religious work. And she had a false support system for the weak prophets of her day. She even fed them. And she became one of their primary financial support systems. Let's continue on. A look at Jezebel. A background of Queen Jezebel and her tactics. A look at 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all of the prophets with the sword, which isn't totally true. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So what Jezebel is doing now, she is usurping authority. She's taking advantage already of Ahab abdicating his role and position, and she's releasing, frankly, a death threat against the true prophet of God. The abdicating nature of Ahab empowered the Jezebel spirit. She resisted and opposed 
true godly authority. You see that? She gave a word to Elijah. So she resisted and opposed true godly authority and desired to control and exercise power and authority over everyone. Because she knew if she could control the messenger and the message, then she would have influence over all the people. She herself set herself up in particular against Elijah. Wow. So this lady was a heavy hitter. She didn't just start low. But she had a methodology. She had a rhyme and a reason. And she worked her way in that sense up a false spiritual authority ladder. She emasculates her husband, pushes him aside, speaks as it were on his behalf, and she even feeds, entices the prophets who have gotten weakened, and she is their supply line, and now she goes to take on the lead prophetic person and voice of that time. A look at 1 Kings 19 verses 3 and 4. And he was afraid. Now who's the he? We just looked at a word that Jezebel gave Elijah. He was afraid and he arose and he ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, which means praise. And he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey in the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough, O Lord, take my life, for I am, for I'm, I am not better than my father's. And so now she has weakened the prophets. She set up a false support system. But God had his plan behind the scenes, and Obadiah was keeping some who had not bowed their knee to Baal, but she isn't aware of that. She uses her husband's platform. She usurps his authority. She weakens him, takes his authority, uses the platform of a king to speak queen edicts over and against the lead prophets to such an extent, now understand, there are demonic forces that are behind words. Remember this phrase from some of my teachings in the past. It is a speech-activated kingdom. That is true for both light and darkness. It is a speech-activated kingdom. Jezebel, knowing this, she moves in a tactic of a declaration when she releases the declaration over Jezebel, she is releasing an atmosphere. She's releasing suppression. She's releasing the demonic forces, because that's who she's in bed with, with Baal and Ashtaroth and other demonic forces, principalities. And she then starts releasing edicts through false declarations. It produces an atmosphere to where Elijah is actually like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what just came over me. Oh my gosh, this is just, I, I, it's like something is just like, man, there's a thick fog. I just can't think. I just like um, walking through molasses right now. Now I, I'm, I'm making those phrases up, but look what it says, what he does. The next very day, he said, he went and he sat under a juniper tree. He's now moving into passivity from a warrior to a victim, from a victor to a victim mindset, and he succumbs to it. He sits under a tree. He gets depressed. He goes, oh, is me, and instead of lifting up his eyes into the hills from which comes all of our help, he puts his chin on his chest, he looks at himself, and he goes, oh my gosh, it's a bad day, and it's really a bad day, and it's going to be a worse day, and I just can't figure out what's going on because it's dark and gloomy, and this is just like so oppressive, and I'm just going to sit here, and I was like, man, I feel worthless. In fact, 
I don't even know that my words pierce anything. Well, they sure aren't piercing this darkness. And he starts listening to the voice of the accuser of the brethren to such an extent that he makes the statement, I wish I was gone. I didn't used to understand these kinds of things. I understood them theologically, but I can't say I had really experienced them in my own life. Unfortunately, or by wisdom, fortunately, I understand this page now. I know what it's like to go into that wrong cave and go, I alone am left. Oh my gosh, this is pitiful. We just as well just wait around. There's nothing good. There's no revival. You know that revival thing? That was a bunch of hype. You know that awakening thing that, yeah, I even prophesied it. Oh, I don't know. I don't see. In fact, I need awakened. In fact, I feel so sleepy. You hear my words? You want to sleep. You want to bury your head in the sand, an ostrich, a groundhog. You want to, like, submerge. And he even says, it's enough. Lord, take my life. Here's what Jezebel, her tactics. Here's what ultimately what Jezebel's atmosphere culture tries to produce. Jezebel causes fear debilitating discouragement, depression, and look at this other word I used, immobility. Look at these words again. Jezebel creates an atmosphere and a culture demonically of fear, fear of man, fear of rejection, fear of authority, debilitating discouragement, not just an occasional discouragement, debilitating discouragement. Despondency is what that is. Depression, and the depression moves Elijah from out of being a mover, an influencer, a shaper, and a doer to being passive into case or all, or all, well, be, be. I don't know about this warfare stuff. I think I'll just take that mantle off. It ain't working anyway. I just am mobilized. Let's look at these four words again. Jezebel causes fear, debilitating discouragement, depression, and immobilization. Wow. Okay, a look at, let's continue on, a look at, I'm going to flip a couple of chapters in the study, a look at 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 5, and 5 to 7. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, how is it that your spirit is so sullen and that you are not eating food? So he said to her, because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite, and he said to him, give me your vineyard for money or else, and if it pleases you, I will give you a vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife, said to him, do you now reign over Israel? Arise, eat bread, let your heart be joyful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jed." the Jezreelite. Jezebel has already now maligned Elijah, created the culture of fear and depression. She now speaks back to Ahab, and Jezebel controls him through scorn and sarcasm, and she takes things into her own hands, and she now says, yeah, I'm, yeah I'll offer you something. It's very fascinating. It says, I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. If you know a little bit of Hebrew, I only found this little piece in the last month. The Hebrew word for prophet is Naba, or Nabi, or Nabiet. Naba, called a Naba prophet, to bubble us and gush forth. Look what Jezebel goes to capture. The field of the Nabas. She goes to get the field of the prophets, the vine, the new wine of Naboth. That would be the wine, 
the new wine of the prophets. That's why she wanted that field, because that was a field of the prophets. So Jezebel, controlled by scorn, sarcasm, and she took matters into her own hands. Let's look at the next set of scriptures. Oh, mercy, I'm going to have to already go faster because we have a lot to cover. We're only beginning. A look at 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 11 through 14. So the men of the city and the elders and the nobles who lived in his city did as Jezebel had sent word to them. Just as it was written in the letters which she had sent them, they proclaimed a fast. They seated Naboth at the head of the people. Then the two worthless men came in and sat before him. And the worthless men testified against him and even Naboth before the people, saying, Naboth, cursed of God and the king. So they took him aside outside the city and they stoned Naboth to death. Then they sent word to Jezebel saying, Naboth, the owner of the vineyard, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. Oh my gosh. This is Jezebel in full force. Jezebel got others to do her dirty work. That's what she just did. The two worthless men. They weren't worthless in God's eyes, but they became worthless in their eyes because Jezebel told them so. And she sent them on a commission. Jezebel got others to do the dirty work and because she believed the end justified the means. She condoned sin, even murder, to get what she wanted. She attempted to remove good men and kill even their spiritual and physical sons. And I'm going to insert a fresh understanding I've only just, just received recently. And see the spiritual sense? Because she is after, as an offering, the vineyard of Naboth. The new wine of the prophets is what she was after. Okay. Let's go to a review of confronting demonic strongholds. This first part is a to is uh, newer, and then the next point, two points after that, I have taught in other series that you might have been a part of, you might not have been. So the following is a review of confronting demonic strongholds. The following is a review of confronting from the deaf and dumb spirit that I've taught previously, and teaching covered in much more detail as a part of my whole class on deliverance from darkness. Okay. So, understanding the nature of demons. One, demons are disembodied spirits longing for a house or a home. I didn't just say body there. I very purposefully used the words a house or a home. So, a body can be a house. But so, a, for a demonic spirit, it could also be a... Um, that's why uh, idols are so important. Okay? Demons are disembodied spirits longing for a house or a home which they can exert their influence from. Number two, demon spirits do not have gender. And I put that in here in the very beginning because we too often speak of Ahab only in reference of that men have are Ahabs and women are Jezebels. And when that teaching is overemphasized, which it has been in times past, then even the term of, for women and strong leadership gifts are called Jezebels. No, I don't do that. That's not what I'm doing. That's not what I'm teaching. It's not what I'm teaching. Because why? Demonic spirits do not have gender. Now, it doesn't mean that certain demonic spirits don't try to influence certain leaders people, positions, even ethnic groups in specific manners. Okay, having said that, let's do these five points quickly. Understanding the nature of demons. Demons are disembodied spirits longing for a house, trying to find one, roaming, looking for a home through which they can exert their influence. Two, demon spirits do not have gender. Three, demonic spirits will attempt to live out their nature through people 
that allow them entrance. The door opens through how? Sin patterns. Four, you already, I really need to reemphasize that some of you will need to get the curriculum of a class that I've done on deliverance from darkness, the book, the study guide, and go through this because some of you are going to be asking a lot of questions, which I've already have covered in thoroughly in those 12 lessons, okay? So listen to this one, number four. You cannot crucify a demon, and you cannot cast out the flesh. You must crucify the flesh, and you must cast out demons. Number five. The ultimate victory over every demonic power is through enforcing the victory of the completed work of the cross of Jesus. Why? Because the seventh statement that Jesus made on the cross was what? It is finished. It is perfect. It is complete. It is finished. The ultimate victory over every, including Jezebel and Ahab, demonic spirits, over every demonic power is through enforcing, not your will, but enforcing the victory of the completed work of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, let's move on. And these next two points are total review from previous material that I have taught. Five levels of spiritual conflict. One, the conflict is between God and Satan, number one. Number two, the conflict between elect angels and then fallen angels, number two. Number three, the spiritual warfare conflict is between Satan, a fallen angel, archangel, Lucifer. A conflict is between Satan and the saints. Who's the saints? The believers at that time. Four, the conflict is between Satan, the god of this world, who blinds the eyes of the unbelievers. The conflict between Satan and the unsaved. And number five, the spiritual warfare conflict is between the law of the mind and the law of the spirit. Following legalism, law, what we think is right, versus a heart engaged with God. The Greek mind is often only about knowledge. I love knowledge. But knowledge puffs up if the heart is not the goal. The Hebrew understanding is it's a heart relationship. The Greek is the exaltation of the mind. The Hebrew is the exaltation of the heart. That's why Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart first. Okay. So five levels of spiritual conflict listed there. Continuing on to the next point. C, spiritual strongholds need to be confronted and exposed. A definition that I believe is one of the best that I have found by my friend Ed Silvosa. A spiritual stronghold is a mindset impregnated with hopelessness that causes us to accept as unchangeable situations that we know are contrary to the will of God. A demonic stronghold is a mindset first that is full of, impregnated with, hopelessness. Because we're supposed to put on the helmet of hope. And hope is the positive expectation of good. Hopelessness is, there ain't nothing good, and there ain't nothing good coming, and this is bad, and it's getting worse. Leading to despondency, despair, disappointment, debilitation. And it causes a person to think that something is unchangeable. But I'm here to say that there are ungodly strongholds and there are godly beliefs, godly strongholds. A God stronghold says nothing is impossible with God. Would you say that with me? Nothing is impossible 
with God. I'm going to give you another statement similar. Nothing is impossible to them who believe. God is looking for believing believers. So, the following is a list of 10 different demonic spirits that we need to expose, dethrone, and overcome in today's world. Now, I could give you other ones. I could give you a list of 20, but here are 10 that I picked. These are 10 demonic spirits that we need to expose, dethrone, declare the truth so that fortress of hopelessness will be penetrated and cast down. Here are 10 Jezebel influence. The eight, number two, Ahab dysfunction. Number three, the stifling religious spirit. Number four, the conniving political plots and ploys. Five, the dulling deaf and dumb spirit. Six, the workings of Leviathan, which twists communication and makes people believe in their hearing understanding something was said that wasn't. Distorts communications. Six, the working of Leviathan. Seven, the paralyzing spirit of fear that causes immobilization. Eight, the seducing spirit of deception that you will want to look at my series on the discerner. Nine, the false supernatural, which is empowered by the spirits of witchcraft and the occult. And then 10, the displacing spirit of antichrist. Again, you'll want to look at deliverance from darkness, but also my series on discerning the discerner, where I go through a lot of this uh, in some detail. Let's move on now, and let's look at 10 biblical characteristics of the Jezebel spirit. Now, in this situation, I'm not listing out Bible verses to go with every one of these 10 points, but if you would read through 1 Kings 16 through 19 in particular, you will find these attributes. No, Roman numeral three, 10 characteristics of the Jezebel spirit. A or one, Jezebel's ultimate goal is always control. The Jezebel spirit is always motivated by its own agenda, which, is, which it relentlessly pursues. Number two, the Jezebel spirit attacks, dominates, and manipulates all authority, and especially male authority. Queen Jezebel usurped political authority of the kingdom. This spirit's ultimate goal is to conquer or neutralize the prophet because a discerning leader is its greatest enemy. I got to redo, reread point two. The Jezebel spirit attacks dominates, manipulates. Another word that would be more graphic would be emasculates male authority. It neuters male authority. Queen Jezebel usurped political authority of the kingdom. She took the king's role. She took the prophet's role. This spirit's ultimate goal is to conquer or at least neutralize the prophet because the prophet is a discerning leader. And thus, discernment is the greatest antidote to Jezebel. So Jezebel tries to put out a prophet and intercessors, discerning leaders. You got to understand that. A wise husband. People in authority. Number two, or, or C, Jezebel causes fear, flight, and discouragement. This word flight is very distinct. I think you understand how Jezebel causes fear and discouragement. But you know what else she does? Causes flight. Flight is where a leader just wants to take off. 
if they don't get into immobilization, stay and become passive and immobilize, the other reaction will be, let's get out of here. Let's get out of Dodge. Let's get out of this revelatory prophetic stuff. Let's break camp in a wrong way. Let's leave town. Let's, let's, it's a called flight pattern. I've seen this over and over and over in families. This spirit often causes a spiritual leader to flee from his appointed place by character assassination and ruining his reputation. Number four, or D, people under Jezebel's influence are natural leaders, although often covertly. The Jezebel spirit attempts to seek out people of influence. Remember, people of discernment, but also people of influence to win their ear, to gain credibility, to get on their platform, to get an endorsement for their toxic cause. They inch their way in to someone else's platform, neutralizes their voice, and comes across with something that is intimidating and enticing. Number, uh, let's see, <clears throat> number six, is it? Yeah, number six then, or F, uh, let's see, where am I? D, oh, E, there we are. Sorry, I had the wrong page there. So, on then number five or uh, E, people under Jezebel's influence are often insecure and wounded with pronounced egocentric needs. They often are trying to fill a love deficit. People under Jezebel's control and influence often have a deep unhealed wounds from a source such as rejection, resistance, fear, insecurity, self-preservation, and bitterness, which in turn spreads its defilement to many. Let's keep moving. Number F or six, the Jezebel spirit functions subtly and deceptively. People controlled by Jezebel use flattery to win you over to their domination. Jezebel spirits are masters of manipulation by guilt and undermining or discrediting another's influence. Those under Jezebel's control use flirtation, use romanticism, use building somebody up even in a wrong way so as to what find favor and take their platform. Those under Jezebel's control use flirtation and are extremely become jealous, territorial, suspicious of what anybody else is doing. They become elite. They become prideful, ingrown, don't associate with others, flight pattern, disassociation. Those under Jezebel's control use flirtation and are extremely jealous of anyone they perceive to be a threat. Next, G or seven. These are 10 characteristics. Ultimately, people under Jezebel's influence are proud. Ultimately, not necessarily in the beginning. Ultimately, people under Jezebel's influence are proud, independent, and eventually rebellious. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, according to 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, and will attempt to control others through any means. This is well-crafted, written right here and will attempt to control others through any means other than the Holy Spirit. H, or eight. It takes an Ahab to let a Jezebel spirit operate unchallenged. Those under Jezebel's influence do not operate without someone under an Ahab spirit. That's passivity and withdrawal. Those under Jezebel's influence do not operate without someone under an Ahab spirit's influence enabling them to function. 
in two weeks, we're going to examine this with some uh, thorough uh, manner, like I'm trying to do this on with Jezebel. Okay, then I or D, or nine, excuse me. A Jezebel spirit is always in alignment. Some things you see, they're progressive in nature. A Jezebel spirit is always ultimately in alignment with a religious spirit. Remember, Ahab marries into Jezebel, and they not only become one flesh, they become one spirit. And there becomes the converging of those demonic forces of Baal, etc., and Astral. Both Jezebel in the Old Testament and in the Revelation in the New Testament operate under the cover of religion. Its religious deeds are done for all to see. True and pure spiritual gifts attract people to Jesus, not to the people who exercise the gifts. I know there's a tightrope here, but the glory goes to Jesus. That's one of the nine biblical tests if a revelation is really from God. It's the fruit it bears. Do they direct the person to Jesus or to another source? And then J or number 10. The families of people under Jezebel's influence are often out of order. I didn't say that is the only reason that families, cities, governments, society, come under disorder. Remember I said that Jezebel spirit, it first starts with a sin. Okay. So the families of people under Jezebel's influence, though, are often out of order. Those under Jezebel's influence control their partners and cause their children to take sides. They make the kids. It's right or it's wrong, it's me or it's him, or him or me or causes division. Mm -mm, that's not the way it's supposed to be. No. But those under Jezebel's influence control their partners and cause them their children to take sides, grow up insecure because there's wrong role modeling. They are taught to disrespect their fathers. They feel manipulation and become distrustful then because there's been a usurping of authority in the home, then it produces that same thing towards authority outside the home, whether in the church or government or wherever, occupations, and can feel manipulated and become distrustful towards true authority. Wow. Okay. So let's keep moving forward. This is a long teaching today, folks. That's why there's only one. Why? then deal with this thing you might be asking. I'm going to give you seven clear reasons why we need to. And before this is over, you're going to want to in a righteous way, not by self-will, no. Not by the arm of the flesh. But why deal with this spirit? For the kingdom of God's sake. This spirit destroys God's true image in the family, and it defies his loving order in the church. And according to Revelations chapter 2, verse 26 to 28, there is a great prize for winning this war. You are called an overcomer. Whenever that is, that I graduate and stay, I, I'd like to be numbered in this group. I'd like to be numbered in a group that was in humility and in holiness, righteous overcomers. Let's do this for the kingdom's sake, and let's do it together. Another reason, number two, for the church's sake. For the kingdom's sake, for the church's sake. When we overthrow the demonic stronghold of Jezebel, we secure lineage and legacy within the body of Christ. As Elijah did 
we will be able to call down rain of revival and breathe life, Ezekiel 37, into the valley of dry bones, into barren places. Instead of it being the place where the prophets came and the prophets died, your valley can become an oasis in God. Why deal with this spirit? For love's sake, number three or C, those operating under Jezebel's snare, they need to be healed. God loves all people, and he wants to see every man and every woman set free in Jesus' great name. So why enter into this battle to win? You're already in the battle if you don't realize it. Why do you want to enter into this battle to win and enforce the victory of Calvary? For love's sake. God deals redemptively with those under Jezebel's influence. That's awesome. Next, number four, or D, for the children's sake, for the kingdom's sake, for the church's sake, for love's sake, for the children's sake. The generational curse of Jezebel can be broken. When confronted with the truth, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When you're confronted with the truth of God's word and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, order can be restored. I've seen it happen. I see it happen. I'm going to see it happen. Order can be restored, and the spirit of Elijah can be poured out, turning Malachi chapter 4, the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Oh, come on. That's why I do it for the children's sake. Here's another reason. For your own soul's sake. Yeah. For your sake. For the kingdom. For the church. For love. For the lineage and legacy for children. And for your sake. The revelation of the morning star is granted to the overcomers. We looked at that verse, didn't read it, but in Revelation uh, earlier, um, in Revelations chapter 2, verses 26 to 28, the revelation of the morning star is granted to overcomers. He himself promises more revelation of himself. Does anybody here want to sign up for that? I do. I want more revelation of the morning star that rises in my heart. I want more revelation of all things work together for good for those who love God and called to his purpose. I want to receive a greater revelation and, and have the light of God permeate every dimension and realm of darkness. So why? For our children's sake, for our soul's sake. Next one, number six, for our health's sake. Yes. Tolerating Jezebel can cause sickness. Therefore, overcoming its influence will do the opposite. Will bring restoration of health and life. I'm committed to this. Because I want to see a restoration of health and life. Do you? Why confront this enemy for health's sake? Tolerating Jezebel causes sickness. Therefore, overcoming its influence will do the opposite. It will be a part of your and your family's restoration, breaking the curse, and receiving the blessing, and speaking it, declaring it generationally bring restoration of health and life. And how about this one, number seven, or G, for obedience sake. We do it just because we're going to obey God. God loves obedience. Obedience is better in God's eyes than a sacrifice. The church of Thyatira left Jezebel alone. But God will richly reward the church in a city that will not tolerate its evil in its midst. Why? Why enter in? One, for the kingdom's sake. Two, for the church's sake. 
three, for love's sake, four, for the children's sake, five, for our soul's sake, six, for our health's sake, and seven, for obedience sake. I just love this so much. There it gives you godly motivation. In closing, breaking the power of Jezebel's stronghold. We've got to learn to walk in the solution. Remember I said it's a speech-activated kingdom? That's part of it. That it isn't just getting right concepts. It's walking them out. Step by step, here a little, there a little. Taking the land. Taking our land. We're going to be some of the spies that bring back a good report. And we're going to say we are able to go up and take this mountain. We're going to conquer territory. Walk out the solution. One, it is a sin that requires repentance. Two, receive and release forgiveness in the blood of Jesus to yourself first. Have you been Jezebel? Have you come under the Ahab influence? It's a sin that requires repentance. It's a sin that requires confession and then receiving and releasing to others forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. Three, we must renounce the influence of this evil stronghold. Four, we must do what the book of James says, submit to God. It doesn't say resist the devil first. Submit to God. Resist the devil in the great name of Jesus. And five, proclaim freedom to the captives and the favorable year of the Lord. That's from the book of Isaiah, and that's from the Gospels. Jesus opened up the prophet of Isaiah, and he said, today, this word of this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to proclaim good news, to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty those who are bruised, and to declare the favorable year of the Lord. This can be your jubilee. This can be your time of crossing over into new beginnings for your life and new beginnings for your family and your concentric spheres of authority. I know that there's a lot more to say, but I trust that you'll reread these notes. I trust that you'll now read 1 Kings 16, 17, 18, 19. I trust that you'll be a part in two weeks with the next webinar on the Ahab problem and the Jehu solution. I want you to hang in there. Some of you are going to need maybe to get my deliverance from uh, uh, deliverance from darkness class. Some of you probably might maybe need to uh, re-go through the discerner or something else. Okay, but let's now pray. Prayer, closing prayer of command. Father, I come to you in the great name of Jesus, and I confess and renounce as sin my actions and attitudes that I have partnered in myself of manipulation, domination, and controlling other people. I repent for operating in the ways of Jezebel. Forgive me. And I choose to forgive myself. I receive your love and obediently submit to you. I resist the devil and stand against these demonic strongholds in Jesus' mighty name. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, I receive by faith my freedom. By the grace of God, I will honor delegated authority in my life and not displace them. And I thank you for a new beginning of purity, humility, and holiness, and truth. 
and the truth shall set you free. Amen and amen. This is James Gall giving us notes, teaching, biblical perspective, and some experiential understanding on exposing Jezebel's influence. And know this.